Hey everyone, happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. I'm your host, John Lorden. This episode's being recorded for March 30th, 2018. I want to give a big thank you to Susan for getting me connected with a man named Jeff Buziak. Now, Jeff is the father of a woman that was brutally murdered in a home that she was showing. She's a real estate agent. This happened back in 2008, a bit of a popular case. It's been covered by uh, Dateline. It's been covered on Crime Watch Daily, a couple of other podcasts. Um, it's a very intriguing case. There is a lot to it. And one of the things that really motivated me to cover it uh, primarily was seeing Jeff's amazing work with this case. This is a father that has not stopped. Uh, if you take a look at Google News results around this, you will see every single year he has a march in Lindsay's honor. Let me bring up a photo of her here. Here we go. Uh, every single year he has a march in her honor around on the day usually uh, that she was killed. And that happened all the way up until this past February 2nd. Um, and every time he does it, you can see the press that comes in around it. He brings the awareness back to this story. He is, speaks very openly. He maintains a website, uh, including a pretty good um, timeline that we're going to go over, but also his thoughts and theories. And this is a man that's not afraid to name names. Uh, not afraid to go confront someone on the street and ask them if they are involved in this or not. Uh, this is a father whose heart is really out there in terms of this case. And it's very inspiring to see that, particularly when you have a case that is 10 years old and still not solved. So Jeff, uh, just know that uh, I really appreciate how hard you're working on this. I hope this video in some way helps you and helps this case move forward. And let me just say before we get started in this, that Jeff, if there's any clarifications we need to make, or if there's additional details that you want us to go into here on the channel, you have an open invitation. We would certainly appreciate having you on the channel to be interviewed and to help us understand this case better. But I wanted to start with an episode where I'm covering the basics, what's out there in the media, and trying to get my head around this case because there is a lot, a lot to look into in the different theories in particular. Um, and it's just, it's very deep and kind of convoluted. So let's go ahead and get started first with the location where this happened. Just a quick stop at Wikipedia to learn about Saanich in British Columbia. And if you don't know, that is in Canada. The district of Saanich is on Vancouver Island in British Columbia within the greater Victoria area. The population was 114,148 at the 2016 census with an area of 103.44 square kilometers uh, just about 40 square miles. It is the largest municipality in Greater Victoria. And one of the things that you're going to hear, particularly if you review a lot of web content on this, is despite a pretty decent population size, it seems like this is a pretty close-knit community, a community where people know each other. Um, so I guess, you know, that's also a cultural affect, right? Just kind of how friendly are people? Do you know your neighbor? I can tell you just from me living in California my, most of my life and now living in Minnesota, uh, where you live regionally can certainly affect how many people you know around you. Quite honestly, I didn't know many of my neighbors in California, but uh, let's go ahead and move forward. And this article is actually jumping ahead a little bit. This is from January 31st of 2013, but it has a pretty good synopsis about this case. So I wanted to start here. Uh, and this is from globalnews.ca. On February 2nd, 2008, Lindsay Buziak was stabbed to death inside an upscale home in Saanich's Gordon Head neighborhood. Earlier that day, the 24-year-old received a call from a woman with a foreign accent asking for a showing at about 5.30 p.m. Later, Buziak got a call from a man who said he'd meet with her alone instead. Nervous, she asked her boyfriend to check on her later at the house. At about 6.15 p.m., police received two 911 calls, one from outside the house, then minutes later, one from inside asking for medical help. Her murder remains unsolved. Quote, people want to know what went on the evening of February the 2nd, said Jeff Buziak, Lindsay's father. People want to know why an innocent young woman was executed. 
And I certainly agree with them. I know after looking into this, I definitely want to know much more about it as well. Um, jumping over to cbc.ca, please. Uh, and this is now rolling back. So this is February 4th of 2008, only two days after the, the murder. And I just wanted to roll back to talk to you guys about where the media was at, what types of questions they had at the time, and what police were saying in terms of their investigation. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one because if you listen to recaps about this case now, this point, I, I don't, I, I really don't know how it became this much of an issue at the time, but keep in mind this is two days after the crime. Police are focusing on a 911 call as they search for clues in the death of a 24-year-old real estate agent. And here we have a photo of the scene. Um, Constable Brad Bradchick says police do not know how Lindsay Buziak died. Her body was discovered after an unidentified person made a 911 call asking Saanich police to check on an empty house. Uh, sounds kind of mysterious the way this thing's writing it, and I don't think it's that mysterious, but quote, the 911 call is a very important part of our investigation right now, and we are not going to release the information about the 911 call, Bradchick said. We're hoping to find out, first of all, what happened inside this home, and second of all, whether someone has been involved in this crime. Meanwhile, real estate agents in Victoria are in shock over the death of one of their colleagues. They say Buziak had a bad feeling about a cell phone call she received last Saturday asking her to show an empty home in an upscale neighborhood. She went anyway. Now, I'm not sure. I've heard this talked about a couple different ways. And typically, you know, I've bought a couple houses. When you reach out to an agent to show you homes, you don't always say, this is the particular home that I want to see. Uh, I know nowadays it's a bit more common because there's websites like Zillow and stuff like that, where, you know, I could go look at homes that I'm interested in and then talk to my agent and say, I want to get into this house. I want to, I want to check out the inside of this place and see if I want to put an offer on this. Back in 2008, I don't know if it was as common as that. So my question here is, this phone call that she received, did they really tell her specifically, we want to see this address? Or did they say, we're just looking for homes and here's the conditions? And I think we're going to be able to answer this question when we get to a different website. Uh, but that's the question that I'm stuck with at this point. Uh, let's go ahead and bump forward and see if we can learn anything else about this 911 call. So now this is literally one day later, February 5th, although admittedly, uh, I think this is a different news source. Yeah, this is back to uh, ctvnews.ca. The realtor who was murdered in a new million dollar home for sale was stabbed multiple times before she died, according to autopsy results released to CTV. Uh, police also said that there were two 911 calls that were made that night at about 6.15. The first was a tip to check on the welfare of Buziak and was made from the upscale home she was living in. Um, that's kind of interesting, and I'm not sure if that's completely accurate either. The second made only minutes later was from someone inside the home who had just found the body. The great uncle of the realtor is also a retired RCMP officer, says he thinks Lindsay Buziak was set up. Gus Buziak, 75, worked in homicide as part of a 30-year career in the RCMP. Quote, she was a pretty young lady and he saw her picture in the paper. I think he called her and she came to the house. It's probably not his first time and it's probably not his last time, he said. I hope to God they get him before he strikes again. Of course, around all this, you have the real estate industry saying, uh, whoa, we, we're kind of worried. How, how are we going to be safer? Uh, the Greater Vancouver Real Estate Board is encouraging agents to take steps to ensure their safety. Uh, introduce the client to someone in your office. Jot down their car description and license plate. Use your own car to get to a property. Uh, check all rooms and determine escape routes. Make sure the doors are unlocked. Use a code word in a potentially dangerous situation. Trust your instincts. Really important one. Uh, it sounds to me like Lindsay really was worried about this initial contact. Um, the situation, I think, kind of overrode her fear because you had people saying, we want to buy a million dollar home this weekend. We're only going to be in town for three days, basically. We need to make this happen. And of course, 
you know, as a real estate agent, you're looking for that commission. You're looking for making money. Uh, and that would have been a significant amount of money, especially for a young agent. From what I understand, Lindsay had only been doing this for, I don't even know if it was a full year at this point. Um, she was kind of a junior agent. So this probably would have been a really big deal to her. Um, have someone from your office relative or a friend stay with you. And then of course, call the police if you are suspicious. Uh, all good tips that I think still make sense today. Uh, jumping forward to February 7th, 2008, almost four days after he found his slain girlfriend in an empty house, Jason Zalo accompanied police yesterday to the place where real estate agent Lindsay Buziak was stabbed to death. And just to put a face to the name, let me find you. Here we go. This is a picture of Jason right here. And this is Lindsay over here. Uh, here's another one of the two of them from the Crime Watch Daily episode. So yeah, that is what's really interesting about this case. So Jason is the person to find her body. Uh, now I know many of you are probably saying, oh, whoa, whoa, hold on, you know, red flag, red flag. No, I totally agree with you, but he has an alibi. He's literally seen on tape at a different location at the same time that these people are showing up to this house showing. Uh, he drives to the house showing because she did talk to him about the fact that she was nervous about this. And he said, well, you know, I'll be sure to come by. Um, he did go to the house showing with a friend of his in his vehicle. So you've got uh, you've got an alibi set up all around this. Now, some people might question, is it too much of an alibi? It's, is it kind of the perfect situation? We're going to dive into that a little bit more too. Um, but it's it's really tough to look at this case and to not have some consideration about Jason's involvement because yes, he is the first one to get to Lindsay and there's a bunch of other stuff around it as well. You'll see as we as we crack into the details here. Um, so yeah, uh, four days later, they do take him back. They make him walk through the house. Uh, while police would not comment specifically on yesterday's crime scene walkthrough, Sergeant John Price, a spokesman for the Saanich police, said such a practice would not be unusual. It's not uncommon in a homicide investigation if people are on the scene prior to police, whether they are witnesses or ambulance attendants, uh, to be asked to retrace their steps so any forensic evidence can be explained. So basically... They wanted to know what he might have touched as he entered. So if they found his print somewhere, they could say, okay, it makes sense. You know, he told us that he did this. Uh, if they find his prints in a different room or, you know, in the kitchen where the knives are kept or something like that, and he doesn't give them a reasonable explanation for that, then they have cause to be concerned about what he's saying. Uh, you can actually find clips of this walkthrough. Uh, on YouTube. And they also include most of those clips in the Dateline episode and the Crime Watch episodes. I'll include all that in the description box below so you can check those out. Uh, I also do want to call out a podcast called Case File uh, that I'm amazed I haven't bumped into before, but is a very good podcast. They did a really good episode on this. Um, I get a little frustrated when I hear information and I don't know where it's coming from. That's part of why I do the show that I way I, the way I do it with you guys. <laughs> so you know where these pieces of info are coming from. Um, but it, to me, it's it's a really good listen if you're interested in this case, and especially in hearing a lot about one of the theories in particular that we're only going to lightly touch on here, uh, I suggest that you check it out. And I'll have a link to that in the description box below as well. But can we crack into the details? Thanks to lindsaybuziakmurder.com, which is the website run by her father, Jeff. Yes, we can. He has uh, the first link on here is the Lindsay Buziak murder timeline. And we're going to go through a lot of it right now. So her boyfriend, Jason, and Lindsay went to Sauce, which is a restaurant for a late lunch. Lindsay and Jason paid the bill at Sauce at 4.24 p.m. Jason went directly to SHC, arriving at 4.29. Uh, from what I understand, I think that is a car shop, if I recall correctly, SHC. Uh, and Lindsay is believed to have gone home to change her clothes. Now they're calling a person here, CO. I'm going to stick with following Jeff's lead here. Uh, if you do listen to the case file podcast, they actually talk about this guy's name, but just know that CO is 
uh, a business partner of Jason's, also plays on a hockey team with Jason, though it's not very clear that they're exactly buddies, that they would kind of go hang out. Um, so that's who CO is when we're referring to that here. CO was standing outside by Jason's vehicle when Jason left the SHC building, uh, at 5:30, and there's footage of them actually leaving at that time. That footage has been positively identified as Jason. That's how we know he is not at the home or anywhere near it when she meets with the buyers. Um, workers left the area at around 5 p.m. So something else important to understand about this area is it's under construction. This is basically a little bit, a little cul-de-sac. Uh, and this view of the home, this is the actual home right here, is from June of 2009. So about a year and a half after the occurrence happened. And even at this time, you can see there's still construction going on here. Basically, this home next door was being built at that time. Uh, and the cul-de-sac is pretty small. I think there's only one, two, three, and I believe this is as of today, there's only four homes on this cul-de-sac. It's very, very small. So, um, the construction workers were working, despite this being a Saturday, uh, they were working up until five. And then of course, Lindsay is showing up here at 5.30 to meet with these buyers. Some people wonder, was that planned or not? Because, you know, the construction workers are leaving. You've got a bunch of witnesses that have left. And then a half hour later, you have the culprits showing up. Uh, something I wonder about is... Um, You've got other neighborhood here that was already pre-existing. You've got houses all across the way, the way all up and down uh, Tor Torque Street. Hope I'm saying that right. Um, and this is a Saturday afternoon. So some of the witness statements, I believe, are coming probably from neighbors that live in these houses here. And there is some things that they witness in particular about the couple that show up to take a look at the house. And here we get to it. Two witnesses saw the suspect couple walk into the cul-de-sac at approximately 5.30 p.m. The witnesses saw Lindsay greeting the couple by the back of her car in the driveway. There were papers on the trunk of Lindsay's car. The real estate lockbox, you know, the locks that they basically keep the keys in on the door, uh, was accessed at 5.29 While driving, Jason said to Lindsay, I'll come meet you and I'll be 10 to 15 minutes or so. And Lindsay replied to Jason, okay, I'll see you in a bit, I gotta go. The Mexicans are here. And apparently that was kind of her nickname for this couple. Um, when the woman spoke to her, she had used an accent and Lindsay was having trouble understanding what accent it was. It's one of the things that kind of gave her pause and why she was concerned about what, what was going on with this deal. She said it kind of sounded like a Spanish accent, but not really. She thought that the person might have been faking the accent for some reason. Uh, apparently, this was Lindsay's shorthand name for her clients. Jason was seen by video surveillance leaving SHC at 5.30, as I had mentioned. 5.38 p.m., Jason sends Lindsay a text just a couple minutes away. That text was never opened by Lindsay. Jason stated on Dateline that when he was parked on Tor Torque, he sent Lindsay another text that said, Are you okay? Um, there's a little bit of a dispute being noted here because according to one of the detectives, they're saying that the last text that Jason sent was the one that says, I'm just a couple minutes away at 538. But her father's trying to point out, according to Jason himself, he's saying that he sent another one saying, are you okay? Um, I would like to think that they have the records from his actual phone and they could clear that up for Jeff. I don't know why the detectives haven't cleared that up for Jeff at this point, but he's just pointing out that there's a bit of an inconsistency here. Now from 538 to 541, police believe this is when Lindsay was murdered. And the reason for that is because of what happens at 541. Her Blackberry makes a phone call out and the police believe that it was the direct result of the attack. It was basically a pocket dial. Uh, the Blackberry was in her pocket. I don't know if she might have bumped up against the wall or maybe it was when she was knocked to the floor or something around, along those lines, but it basically was a pocket dial that went out at 541. Per Detective Sergeant Horse, uh, Horsley, when Jason and CO drove into the cul-de-sac at approximately 545, Jason and CO saw the front door open and the male suspect outside. 
but only saw the back of him. Jason parked his vehicle on the opposite side of the road uh, to the house. So let's just go back to the map here so we can kind of explain it here for you. So obviously the house is on this side. He parks on this side, but according to some information I've seen, he doesn't park directly across from the house, but kind of further down here away from it, maybe even over here where in his rear view mirror, he's kind of watching the front of the house, but he's not particularly close to it. Now he's there for about 10 minutes and then decides he's going to change location. He comes down the road, makes a right, and then winds up parking right next to the house on the side here. And one of the reasons why I have this satellite view up is because there's a lot of talk uh, when you look into this case about the backyard. From what I can see here, there is no real backyard to this house. Uh, you can see the way that these homes are sectioned. This one has a pretty big backyard and the fence line is right here. This house is cut kind of sideways. So it has a bit of side yard here uh, and a bit of side yard here that has kind of a patio area built on it. Uh, almost the same as how this house is. You can see this house has no real backyard either. It's got land kind of off to the side of it. So I believe when we're hearing reference to the backyard, they're actually talking about the side yard that is over here. So uh, as I said, you know, Jason sat there for about 10 minutes, then he drove out and made the right on Torque. Uh, they parked by the house for approximately another 10 minutes. This is supposedly when he sent the text message saying, are you okay? And he didn't get a respond. That a response. At that time, both CO and Jason walked up to the front door and found it locked. Jason called 911. This is at approximately 6.05. Uh, they both went around to the Torque side of the house and CO gained entry via the already open patio doors by Jason boosting CO over the patio fence, who then opened the front door, allowing Jason entry. Now, I'm seeing some discrepancies around what was going on with the patio. Um, I've heard, uh, I think it was in the podcast, they were talking about some wood slits having been kicked out of the fence. I don't know if they're talking about the fencing that was going around the patio or if they're talking about fencing that was bordering the other houses that were behind that house. But I have seen several references saying that Jason had to give CO a boost over the wall. And basically that is why Jason goes back to the front of the house and waits as CO runs through the house, unlocks the front door and lets him in. When they found Lindsay's body, CO called 911 at 611. And while on the phone, he could hear sirens coming. The police were there within minutes because they were already en route after Jason made the first 911 call at 605. When police arrived, Jason and CO were waving their arms in the upstairs bedroom window. The police went into the home up to the bedroom and immediately took both Jason and CO to the police station separately. Now, one of the things that bothers me when you look into this case, if you do watch the footage of Jason walking through um, with the detective telling him how he entered the home, is that Jason opens the door and by his own words says that he calls for Lindsay as he runs right for the stairs, runs right up the stairs, runs right into the master bedroom and right to where her body is. And it just bothers me because this is kind of a big house. And how did he know to go there in particular? I don't know. Uh, Jeff kind of raises that question as well. Um, the, the detective that's with him in, in the footage is even asking him, you know, what did you see? What did you hear? What did you smell at this time? I believe he's looking for some reason why Jason went in that particular direction. And Jason doesn't seem to give him any answer, at least in the footage that I've seen there. So... A little bit suspicious to me that, um, I don't know, that he was able to locate her right off the bat, literally within seconds of opening the door of a $1 million home with four bedrooms. Now, to make things even more interesting, the cell phone that the couple used to contact Lindsay was basically a burner phone purchased in late November 2007 at a Vancouver convenience store. It wasn't activated until late January of 2008 nearly two months later, and the phone traveled to the island 24 hours prior to Lindsay's murder. Vancouver is from where the first calls to Lindsay were made, confirmed by hits on cell towers in the city. Police said at least half a dozen calls were made to Lindsay, and after her murder, 
the cell phone was never used again. Um, from what I've seen, basically before, the only usage that happened on that cell phone was specifically to Lindsay. Uh, so some people are wondering, was this phone bought in particular just for this act? Was this something that was really being planned all the way back from November? Or are we dealing with a criminal element that maybe does these things in bulk that knows that, hey, we want to buy a bunch of phones because we're going to use them for whatever illegal activities and they just happen to grab this one to use in this case of a contract hit on Lindsay. Uh, I, I don't know. I really don't know what to believe at this point. Detective Sergeant Horsley Quote, there is nothing in her life and we've conducted an extensive background check that would indicate she, that she was involved in anything criminal, in anything of a domestic violence relationship. And that is the most perplexing thing. It is also possible Buziak's killers were under the mistaken impression she had revealed information she shouldn't have, he said, or perhaps that she was somehow connected to a dangerous person without knowing it. And this is where I want to touch on one of the theories here. I'm not going to, going to go into it in heavy, heavy detail. Um, I think if we bring Jeff on the channel, maybe we'll dive into it a bit more. Case File does a pretty good job of going over it. But essentially, um, even the Dateline episode touches on it a little bit as well. Essentially, one of the theories that detectives come to are... Uh, it seems like some friends of Lindsay are involved in drug deals. And there is a huge drug bust that goes down, I believe in Calgary, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and it happens around the time that Lindsay actually visits out there and she makes contact with some childhood friends, as I understand it. But these childhood friends are now involved in some illegal activity. It's one of the biggest drug busts to happen in the country. So... The investigator's theory is that someone connected to that drug industry gets the word somehow that Lindsay is an informant that is responsible for this major bust that happens. And that is the motivation for this contract hit to take place. The thing that's tough about that is police have come out, at least on the Dateline episode, I believe, and said uh, she is not the informant. They're very clear. She is not the person that gave them any tip off. Uh, what supports that theory a little bit is she did say to her father that she saw something that she shouldn't have seen. But there's also some interesting connections that happen with Jason. He also is one step away from people that are doing illegal activities as well, including drug deals and actually worse things. So... Um, I don't know. I don't know if I buy the big kind of super theory that has been wrapped up in this, that she's connected to uh, this major drug bust. There is a smaller drug bust that kind of happens, and it seems a bit closer to home because it's friends of Jason's in particular. And now you're talking about a situation where maybe um, they were at a friend's house and she walked into something she shouldn't have seen. Maybe the friend was visiting at their home. She was living with Jason for a, a little bit kind of off and on during this year. Um, maybe the friend was doing something in their home that she wasn't supposed to have seen and it irked her. Uh, she was talking to certain friends of hers about leaving Jason. She went and visited her father and told him that she was having some trouble in the relationship as well. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I buy this kind of super drug theory. It kind of, it just, I, I don't see the connectivity here. Uh, and police make a very good point in the Dateline episode. The detectives themselves say, look, we haven't been able to find any information that says that she had anything to do with that industry or had any information about what's going on with, with these deals. Uh, why would someone that was part of that, what information did they find that would make them think that she was actually part of any of this? Um, it's, it's kind of a decent point, but let's go ahead and move forward also on uh, Jeff's website here for his daughter and take a look at the photos that he's included. And I think this first one's going to answer a question that I asked you guys at the start of this episode. Now, were they looking for that specific property or were they looking just for her to find properties for them to go look at? Here, we have her notepad and we can see what's written on there. First thing is one million, needs to buy in two days. 
new, needs to be a new house, uh, at least three bedrooms and three bath, large master bedroom, uh, a housekeeper area, some separate area for their housekeeper, and 15 to 20 minute drive from the city. And then it's got 530 written under it. And I believe that's probably the phone number of the burner phone that's down there as well. Um, and this is all being written down on February 1st. So if this is the only note that has to do with this deal that was able to be found, my assumption would be they weren't in particular driving what houses she was going to show them. Um, how could they have known? Was, is there only one house that meets this criteria in the area that they were looking at? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the feasibility of that is. Doesn't seem like it's really feasible to me. Uh, is it that there was a couple different phone calls, which we know there was, maybe in one of them, they gave her these details and then they kind of called her back later and said, oh, you know, we were looking online and we think we found one. Can we go see this place together or something along those lines? Uh, maybe. What I find curious about it is I've looked at the blueprints, which are actually down below, and one of the things they're saying that they're looking for here, a separate area for their housekeeper, um, this house doesn't even have that. So I don't know how they got to this home. And that becomes very important if you start looking into some of the conspiracy theories that are under all this. And of course, you have to look at conspiracies here because we know there is a conspiracy at play here. Um, but one of those theories is that Jason's mother is connected to the person that is developing these homes. Um, so she's already aware of this location, essentially. Is it something where Lindsay would have asked her, would have said, hey, I got this phone call on this potential $1 million deal. Do you know of a location like this? And then that way she could be guided to this location. I don't, I don't know. But I'm just wondering about how strong the connection is about that particular location? Was it really planned to be that specific house that Lindsay was supposed to take them to? And if so, how did they control that decision? How did they make that really happen? Uh, other photos are showing here. This is the entrance to the bathroom is right here. And essentially this patch of floor is where she died. Um, let's jump down to the maps real quick. So here we can see the main floor. This is the second story floor. Here is the master bedroom. And this red X is where she was found. Um, and you can match that up by the door to the bathroom, basically, uh, which you can see right here. It looks like as part of the investigation, they removed the wood flooring uh, that she was on. Looks like they also removed um, the baseboards that were all the way around this room, probably looking for some type of evidence. Uh, this is an interesting thing. This dress was seen by a witness um, by the woman that was in the area. And they said that the man, the man was a Caucasian, about six feet tall, dark hair. The woman seemed to be uh, in having blonde hair that wasn't quite to her shoulders, might have been a wig, but they could see this specific pattern coming out from under a jacket that the woman was wearing. Now, unfortunately, this is not a unique dress. Uh, it's a department store dress, so it didn't help them a whole lot, except for the fact that um, they have some idea of what the woman was wearing. But some people question, is that almost a distraction tactic in itself because it's so bold that, of course, if you're looking at this person, you're going to notice that and you might not actually you know, spend a whole lot of time taking in her features of, of her face or something along those lines. Uh, here we have photos, pretty much the same views that we're getting from Google. I'd bet that they're actually from Google Maps, including that patio area, which I have a few questions about. And the floor layout. And I, I just want you guys to take a look at the floor layout real quick and consider this with me. Uh, you've got the front entrance here. You've got this kind of hallway that kicks to the stairs. Behind that, you've got a kitchen. You've got a formal dining room. You have doors that lead to a bathroom, to a laundry room, another door that leads out to the garage. You've got a living room down here. You've got the patio entrance. The double doors that apparently um, CO comes in are over here. You can see there are no doors on the back wall to let you out to that backyard area or the very thin backyard area. Um, which once again leads me to believe that those wood panels that have been kicked out were probably out of the patio area, but then you have to wonder why did CO jump the fence? Didn't he notice that there were some panels missing? 
Um, but how many rooms do we have down there? I think I probably went six or seven. And then upstairs, we've got four bedrooms. You've got another bath, uh, the master bath. I mean, you're talking 11, 12 rooms. And the guy runs in, heads right up the stairs, goes right into the first door and finds her. Just very, very suspicious to me. All right, heading over to Vancouver Sun, just to get a little bit of input on uh, one of the friends that has some connectivity to Jason. We want to talk about Zachary Scott Matheson. And this is another drug deal that occurred in the area, February 18th of 2014. You can see a big table full, looks like a bunch of pot, looks like some other stuff too, white powder, possibly pills, money counting machine, scales. Um, Matheson has a lengthy criminal record for property, drug, and violence-related offenses, and is well known to police for his criminal associations on Vancouver Island. He was once charged with second-degree murder for the shooting death of a man who had begun dating Matheson's former girlfriend. But after Matheson associate David Nybergall pleaded guilty to the slaying, the murder charge against Matheson was stayed by the Crown. Matheson is also a friend of former Lindsay Buziak boyfriend Jason Zylo, according to a website dedicated to finding Buziak's killer. The photo of Matheson below is from that site. Uh, and on other pages on Jeff's website, you'll see pictures of this guy um, with Jason and with Jason's brother in particular. It's fairly clear that they're connected. Jeff seems to think that they have lied about that connectivity. I can't really find a particular statement to support that. Um, but these are guys, I think they've also played hockey together. There's, there's quite a few photos of them actually being together. So it's clear that Jason has some connectivity to people. I'm not saying that he has connectivity himself to any criminal acts, but he literally knows people that are conducting some fairly serious crimes here. And quite honestly, for me, believing a theory that involves uh, this direction of friends and what's going on between Jason and Lindsay is quite a bit more believable to me than you know, she flew across the country, went to see her dad, talked to some old, you know, school friends, and someone thought that she tipped off the police because of that. It just, the feasibility seems really low for me, but maybe I don't understand enough about it. Uh, rolling forward to cbc.ca, here is a picture of Lindsay. Nine years after Lindsay Buziak was killed, a strange message that appears to be a confession was posted on a website devoted to the case. Of course, once again, Jeff's website. Quote, I killed Lindsay and stupid cops will never prove it. So you all got nothing. Begins the post on the website started and run by her father, Jeff Buziak. He calls out Saanich police that they'll never prove it and they've shut down the investigation, Buziak says. Uh, I did find an original posting of it. It's, I didn't want to share it with you guys because it's, it's kind of insulting the way that it's written. Uh, the main points are coming across in this, in this article. He's basically saying that um, the police are faking this investigation at this point and they just need to stop and put it all away and you know boohoo there's nothing you guys can do about it uh, and that's being very light with how it was worded uh, quote this is the first time we've had someone step up and claim that they're responsible for the murder i've asked for that from the beginning that the coward should step up should step forward and maybe this coward has decided to take responsibility for it so hopefully sanich please figure that out Police in Saanich, which is part of Greater Victoria, say they're aware of the website and what's posted on it, but would not comment further. And I know this week we've we've kind of run the gamut. We had a case on Searchlight early this week where we talked about cops doing a pretty amazing job in a missing person's case and the father really appreciating their work. Uh, we had an itchy mystery where we're you know talking about fallen cops and type taking a look at it from their perspective of what their job is like and how hard it is. But in this case, we've got a father not happy with the police work that's going on, being very clear about it. Um, 
And it seems like he was actually in that position from early on, pretty early on in the case. But now you're talking 10 years later. Of course, he's going to be upset with how this has gone. Um, you know, he's asked for the case to be transferred to another type of division. I don't know if he's really gotten anywhere with that. That's one of the things I would love to ask him if we do have Jeff come on the channel. Um, it's just, it's a really tough situation uh, because you've got what seems like such little movement. And admittedly, this is a very tough case to crack. I mean, just think of it forensically. You've got a completely clean location. This is a brand new home that is being built in this area. You've got people she is completely unfamiliar with. They are supposedly clients. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting about this case is they called her initially on her personal cell phone number. And she even asked them, well, where'd you get this number from? They said, well, we were referred to you by some other clients of yours. She tried to reach out to those clients. Unfortunately, they weren't in town at the time. Um, so once again, even that is showing there was definitely some research that went on here, even for them to be able to fake the reference. They had to know some real clients that she had. But for you to research that and to not be able to research what her business line is, I mean, try to find the business phone or phone number for any realtor uh, in Canada or in the US. It takes you about two seconds. I mean, their phone number is their business. So how did they use the wrong phone number in this case? Or was there a particular reason? I don't know. But it's showing a level of personal knowledge of Lindsay uh, that makes me quite a bit uncomfortable about what's going on in this case. Now we're going to jump to some current media about this case from timescolonist.com, an article written on February 1st, 2018, right before the 10th anniversary of her, I hate calling it an anniversary almost, but I don't know what else to say there. Um, people are withholding information in Buziak murder case, police say. Saanich police said they believed a number of people have personal and firsthand knowledge of the killing and have withheld this information. Saanich police have worked tirelessly with the RCMP and Victoria Police in partnerships to achieve success. After 10 years of work, we regret the success has not been achieved to date in our investigation. As with other pre-planned and targeted murders, the perpetrators and or conspirators have taken steps to avoid apprehension by police, the statement said. Lindsay's father, Jeff Buziak, has been highly critical of the police investigation. He's created a website about her slaying. Saanich police say websites, blogs, and social media platforms have provided a forum for a lot of speculation about the homicide and the investigation. Quote, although not actively participating, the Saanich police are aware of the many falsehoods, accusations, and erroneous information posted on the internet. While providing clarification is difficult, the investigators are aware that much of the posted information is either false, misleading, or deliberately fabricated, the statement said. Um, I really wonder about that comment about deliberately fabricated. If you really did suppose that some of this information was being deliberately fabricated, wouldn't you look at that in particular to see who was doing it and why? I mean, if it's a known manipulation, wouldn't you think that might be someone involved in this case in some way? I don't know. Uh, this is a tough one. Uh, after watching a bunch of interviews, watching the segments that I told you guys about before, hearing uh, some of these detectives interviewed, um, it's really tough. I, I feel like I totally understand where Jeff is coming from. Uh, he's worried that these guys just don't have the experience to crack this case. Uh, case file pointed out that several of the most experienced investigators literally retired the day before uh, she was murdered. And it just, is this a, the case of, you know, the, the new blood getting in there and saying, no, nah, we'll take this, you know, we got this one, let's just roll with it and, and trying to make a name for themselves and just not being able to pull it off for 10 years. I don't know. Um, it's just, it's, it's a heartbreaker on several fronts. We want to be able to trust our public services when it comes to things like this. And I can totally understand that, you know, uh, after 10 years, this man, Jeff, doesn't feel like he can trust them. 
Uh, here's another article from cbc.ca, February 2nd, 2018. We can see he is doing what he has done every year since this occurred. He's having another march, and you can see he's got a bunch of supporters with him, which I'm really happy to see. Jeff Buziak Front led a march in Saanich, BC on Friday to mark the 10th anniversary of the murder of his daughter, Lindsay. He's frustrated that police have still not made an arrest in the case. Quote, the police know who killed my daughter, Buziak said. They know what is going on, and yet they can't seem to take it over the goal line. I, I wonder about that. I wonder if this is a case where they truly do have a suspect in mind, or they truly do think that they know the answer, but they just don't have the forensic evidence or the evidence period, uh, circumstantial or otherwise, to make this work in court. I really don't know if this case is at that state, because... Uh, despite the fact that there is a lot of commentary that comes out of this police department about this case, uh, the actual information that they're sharing with us is quite thin. Uh, so it's it's really tough to know for personally, uh, is, is this case really at that point? Uh, Sergeant Chris Horsley says Buziak is mistaken about the quality of the evidence. Quote, he is really forming his opinions based on things that are out there on social media, internet, websites, and blogs that are putting things out there that for the most part simply aren't true, Horsley said. Uh, if we had the grounds to go forward to seek charge approval from Crown Counsel, we certainly would have done so at this time. Horsley said the investigation into Lindsay Buziak's death is ongoing. Uh, one of the things that's interesting to me is We've now seen two quotes from them where they're saying that, hey, look, there's people that are talking on the internet and they're saying that they're saying stuff that isn't true. Uh, would it be terrible for them to tell us what those things are? Would it really compromise the investigation at this point? And let's be honest here. We're talking about uh, 10 years into this case at this point. Is this ever going to turn into a conviction? Is it more important that maybe we actually just have the truth come out rather than even seek a conviction in this case and let a father move on with his life? Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's one of the things I struggle with when these cases go on for as long as something like this has. I do think that there needs to be some mechanism. I think there's a right way to do it. I'm not saying I have all the answers, but there needs to be some mechanism of as a case ages, there is certain information that gets released to try to help move that case forward. And despite the fact that we have um, a lot of commentary that has come out of this police department for all the media that has surrounded it, there hasn't been a bunch of great information or actually anything even useful in terms of what to look for. We don't know what the murder weapon is like. And, you know, you can do some analysis on that. I'm sure they have some idea what type of knife this is. It's obviously not going to be something silly like a kitchen knife. I mean, you've got a house where those items aren't even there. Uh, you have her stabbed multiple times, at least uh, according to the information we do have. Uh, and if the person was using a knife that wasn't made for that, it probably wouldn't have a hilt. They probably would have injured themselves, most likely would have left some type of DNA trace on her or on the scene. There's a, even a bit of a conflict about that. The official word from the sources I'm seeing seems to be that there was no DNA found. Uh, the unofficial word on the case file podcast in particular seems to be that, yeah, there is DNA, but police aren't trying to talk about that. They really don't want that information out there for some reason. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know which way to believe it. It's kind of hard for me to believe that you could go through a, a scene like that, uh, even just a struggle with someone and not leave behind some kind of DNA. And that's one of the things that's different about this case as well. They don't think there was much of a struggle. It seems like she was attacked from behind. Uh, she probably was showing them where the bathroom was. She was facing the other direction. Uh, a couple of blows could have been struck before she even knew what was happening. So I understand why maybe there isn't any DNA evidence under her fingernails or something like that. Um, but anyone that's wielding a knife, pretty easy to hurt yourself. Uh, we have a woman with blonde hair. Did they find some of those fibers? Do they know for a fact that it was a wig or did they find real hair fibers and maybe could get a DNA sample from that? We don't know. And this is 10 years of not knowing. I'm just, I'm saying this because I want to echo Jeff's frustration. I, I completely understand why he's so frustrated with this. 
Uh, we're going to jump to Wikipedia, just a little information that they give us here. It might be part of the rumor mill, too. I really don't know at this point. Uh, according to the Saanich Police Department, Jason has been interviewed several times over the years and has always cooperated with the police. He's also passed a polygraph test. However, he has always refused to provide a DNA sample. And that information is also coming from the Case File podcast. Once again, because they don't cite their sources, I can't tell you if that's actually true or not. I don't know why he wouldn't provide his DNA. We know that he was in the house. We know that he went up and found her body. Uh, his DNA is likely there anyway. I don't know why he wouldn't give a sample. If that is true, that is a very interesting thing. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've heard it from the cops in those interviews I've seen, uh, or from the investigators. They do seem to put a lot of stock into the fact that they interviewed him and he passed a polygraph. So we, we know he's not involved in this. Uh, before I started doing this channel, I might have felt that way as well. Uh, I have looked into faking polygraph tests. There are people out there who teach people how to be able to pass polygraph tests. Um, there's tons of information that is available. It is not impossible to fake out a polygraph machine. It just isn't. Uh, so what's frustrating for me is looking at this story, looking at this case, that is not enough to rule him out. Uh, in the same manner, I think that they shouldn't rule anyone out at this point, at least with the limited information that they've provided publicly about what's going on. And admittedly, even the kind of what I believe is a far-fetched scenario about this big super drug deal that supposedly, you know, she upset someone because they thought that she tipped someone off when she really didn't. Uh, how can we get to theories like that, but we can't consider, hey, maybe some guy, maybe he passed that polygraph uh, and he shouldn't have, especially if he's denying to provide a DNA sample. I don't know. I don't know. The family of Jason Zalo were investigated due to their connections with the cul-de-sac. DeSousa Court is named after developer Joe DeSousa, a friend and business associate of Cheryl Zilo, Jason's mother. Part of the cul-de-sac was still under construction at the time of the murder, and DeSousa himself was at the location an hour before the murder, supervising the construction work. However, the police have stated that no one in the Zilo family is a suspect. Uh, I don't think they've identified any suspects. So later in 2008, a close friend of Lindsay's called Nikki claimed that she was woken by a telephone call in the middle of the night from an unknown number. As she was half asleep, she did not register much of what the female caller was saying, but she noticed that the caller had a strange accent that she could not place. She became scared when she remembered that Lindsay had reported that her unidentified client and possible murderer had an odd accent. Now fully alert, she called the number back, but no one picked up. She called repeatedly 20 or 30 times until someone answered. The person on the other end of the line was Shirley Zylo. Nikki asked Shirley why she called her and how she had her number, as they did not know each other. Shirley replied that she meant to call another Nikki, her secretary, and that she didn't know why this Nikki's number was in her contact list, but presumed that her son Jason must have added it. Shirley Zilo categorically denies that this event occurred and it has not been publicly revealed whether Nikki's claim was followed up by the authorities. Um, I'd be really curious to know if that was true also, and that could be something as simple as Nikki providing um, her phone bill. I, quite honestly, uh, I'd even take a screenshot of, of her call log on her cell phone just to show that that was actually what happened there. Um, you know, in these cases, I always look for the silver lining. Uh, here we take a little bit of a dodge before we get to the silver lining. Real estate agent's sexy billboard ad sets tongues wagging. Uh, we have a billboard here. Let me take you, let me take you home. It's gorgeous inside for a Remax agent, uh, Diana. Uh, Remax is actually the same company that uh, Lindsay was working with, I believe. Uh, and we get a quote here from Jeff Buziak, an advocate for agent safety whose own daughter, real estate agent Lindsay Buziak, was murdered by a client while showing them around a home in Calgary. I don't know if it was in Calgary. Uh, anyway, it scares me that anyone would want to put an invitation out there as subtle as it might be or humorous as some might think it is. I do believe it's an invitation opening the door for something else that is not real estate. Yeah, I don't know that... Uh, 
And several commenters uh, on this article kind of talk about that too. You know, who's going to hire this person um, to use them for their home purchase or home sale, uh, particularly if they're in a committed relationship? I don't know if my wife would love that that's the person that I'm hiring. Um, but outside of that, November 10th, 2017, globalnews.ca, uh, we have an article about a realtor that was attacked um, and she decided to try to do something about it. And she has now created an app specifically for realtors, uh, something that is basically you can trigger it if uh, you, you set up a bunch of emergency contacts and then you have your events scheduled. And if you don't check in for like your next meeting or the next showing that you're doing, it notifies all your emergency contacts. Hey, something's up. Uh, let's them know. How, what your battery cell phone life is. It sends them GPS information, basically a map directly to where you where you are. Um, so some good things happening from bad situations. Well, believe it or not, that's not even all the information that I wanted to cover with you guys. I'm almost certain we're going to have a second episode, possibly with Jeff here with me going through this as well. But let's go ahead and talk about the theories and then I'll turn it over to you. Uh, theory one. This is a total stranger, possibly someone that found her online, uh, maybe almost like her family member that used to work for the RCMP uh, suggested, uh, a couple performing some type of thrill kill together. Um, the only issue with that is we don't really have information about any type of sexual assault happening here. We do know there was no robbery, that her purse was left behind, her phone was left behind, um, I don't know how much stock to put in that one, but it's certainly something we have to consider that this could have been, she was targeted, but possibly maybe it was just by an online stalker, maybe by, by someone that did see an ad for her somewhere or something like that. Theory two, some type of drug related issue. Uh, Lindsay tipped off the authorities, uh, a bust happened, and this is the retaliation for that. Uh, like I mentioned, she did state to her father, she saw something she wasn't supposed to. It's a shame we don't have the details of whatever that thing was. I mean, that could be something like this. That could also be something within her relationship. Maybe she saw Jason talking to another woman or something. I mean, who knows? Uh, main problems with this theory, please confirm that she was not the actual source, at least for that big raid that occurred. Um, they can find no direct connection of her being involved in the drug scene, only that she had friends seemingly from her childhood that had possible connections to that. Uh, you'd have to assume that the criminals either found info that the police couldn't in terms of her connection to this, or that the criminals were making a mistake, or that the criminals were somehow misled. And would you want to be the person that's misleading drug dealers in t and using them as pawns to kill someone in a murder for hire situation? I would not want to be that person. But keep in mind, we also have uh, the other direction of possible drug connections, which are friends of Jason. Is it that she walked into something there and possibly saw something she shouldn't have seen and they knew they had to take care of that for some reason? And then in particular, when she noted that she wanted to leave Jason and he caught wind of that, was that enough for them to take some type of action against her? I think we have to consider that too. Um, and that kind of leads into theory three a little bit. Uh, Jason Zylo was upset that she was going to leave him. Uh, I didn't really touch on this, but he actually overheard a discussion she was having with a friend of hers about the possibility of leaving him. They caught him at the door, basically basically listening in at the door. The friend got so freaked out, she ran away. Um, and Lindsay actually ran after her. Things cooled down. Lindsay came back home, went on a vacation with Jason, and it seems like they never talked about it again. Uh, Jason is quoted, and you can see clips of him even saying this, that none of this is ever true. There was She had never planned on leaving him. He doesn't understand any of that. One of the other tough things about Jason is uh, the emotional reaction. Several people are noting he did not seem to be emotional uh, after she died. Uh, Jeff kind of touches on that in a few places as well. This guy just doesn't seem to have the emotional reaction you'd expect from this. Um, it's kind of interesting. The other thing is it really bothers me if you look at the motions that are happening around when Jason shows up to the scene. Um, it's almost like he is just 
missing things by seconds. One of the detectives even says this, if he would have shown up five seconds later, he probably would have seen both of the couple all the way out of the front door. But at the time he showed up, it was just in time for the man to turn around, walk back in and close the door and possibly for them to figure out a different way to get out of the house, likely through that side uh, where they left those two doors open. And then once again, I don't know, did they climb over the wall of the fenced in area there or did they kick out some of the wood panels of the fenced in area? If they did kick out those panels, why didn't, why wasn't that heard by Jason? considering he's got a vehicle where he's either sitting kind of across the street, maybe too far away to hear it at that point. But then 10 minutes later, he drives to that side, most likely the side that they left from. The timing of all that bothers me, really bothers me. And I know there's an investigator on Dateline. Um, actually, I think he's an attorney. But uh, he says that it would be the craziest, dumbest thing for someone to do. You're paying for a contract you know, to, to kill someone and to go to the scene as it's happening and to go in and be there right after it is just a terribly dumb idea. Maybe, but could he also have been potentially kind of working as a lookout for them, making sure that they were clear of the house before he took him and this kind of loose friend of his in and used his friend as his alibi for this whole thing? I really think you have to consider that. Uh, the main problem with any theory touching Jason is this assumption that the police seem to have that he's completely clear because they interviewed him several times and they gave him a polygraph. Uh, theory number four, another one that we didn't go into on this episode at all, her ex-boyfriend uh, that she was with from 2001 to 2006, Matt McDuff. Uh, he also makes an appearance, I can't remember if it's in the Crime Watch or the uh, Dateline, um, but this guy gets very upset, basically breaks down and starts crying when he's even talking about this. Um, there's not a lot of info to actually support a theory where he was responsible for this. He does seem to be into some money. There is some rumor that he might be uh, connected to people that might be able to conduct criminal activities. Um, but some other things that work against this, Jeff her father says that Matt is in constant contact and always offering to try to help in terms of the investigation. Uh, and then of course you see that reaction from him. It just, it hit me that when I saw his reaction, uh, unless he's an amazing actor, um, I felt like he had the reaction that I would have expected from Jason. And I still haven't seen any footage of Jason having, but maybe Jason just isn't wired that way. I, I really don't know. Were these really experts? Are these people that literally just travel the world doing this kind of thing? I don't know. Uh, using the burner phone, pretty smart move, especially the way that thing was purchased. When police try to backtrack it, you're going to a store that sold that thing months ago. Of course, there's no surveillance footage of who bought it. So very, very smart there. Using a knife, much quieter than a gun, especially if you're worried about people being around. This is a Saturday afternoon. Uh, that's one of the things that actually kind of works against it in my mind too, though. If you're going to do something like this, wouldn't it make sense to try to do it during the workday when at least the neighbors on the side street would all, well, mostly probably be gone or be thinned out pretty substantially. Uh, you'd still have the construction workers to contend with, but is that necessarily a bad thing? A lot of noise created at construction sites might've been good cover for them. So I'm honestly not really completely sold that these are total experts that put this together. But once again, that's all dependent on them driving her to this particular house, this particular location. And I just don't know if that's really the case. Why use her personal cell phone number? Really big question that I just can't figure out. Uh, her, her, I'm sure her business number, much easier to find. Once again, this leads me to believe this is someone that passed along information that is very connected to her. They knew a previous client, they knew her personal cell phone number, they knew how to motivate her and how to get her to that location fairly easily. She had a party that night. The time frame that they requested worked really well to get her to that location before this party she was supposed to go to. Seems like they had a lot of personal information in the planning here. Um, another thing is they did it in the master bedroom, which has front facing windows. Uh, the rear bedroom, 
way less that could have been seen through through the window back there. Of course, any of the bathrooms, practically no windows, very small windows in those types of rooms. Uh, I don't know that the master bedroom is the best location for that to have happened. And once again, makes me question if are we really looking at experts here? Uh, the fence boards being kicked out, if they are the patio fencing, or if they're talking about the other fencing along the back for the back neighbors, uh, not a very smart move. I mean, if you are concerned about sounds, now you're kicking out boards. Uh, I don't know. And once again, if they did, if they did have to alter their plan, they couldn't go out the front because Jason was out at the front. Um, I just, I can't believe that he didn't hear it. I mean, he was concerned about her safety. That was the whole point of him being there. Wouldn't he have put himself in a location where he could kind of take in what was happening around the house? I don't know. And one thing I'm really left with is, and this is something that's talked about a lot, particularly in the Dateline episode, is what was done to her seems personal. When people always talk about a knife is a very personal object, multiple stab wounds usually indicate some type of rage for this person. Uh, the Case File podcast even goes into some other things that are a bit more explicit about the types of wounds. I don't know if they're accurate or not, so I don't want to cover them here. Um, but what I wonder is, was that really about inflicting the pain to Lindsay or is that meant to actually hurt someone else? And that is an aspect that I have not seen covered by any publication, any, uh, any of these uh, pieces of media I reviewed. And quite honestly, I haven't even really seen it being considered by Jeff. The state that her body is left in, if you are talking 40 stab wounds, once again, I'm not even positive if that's the right number. Um, is that more of a message for someone else than actually Lindsay? Was that not necessarily about her, but about trying to affect someone else? I think that's a really big question. I hope police are looking in that direction, just moving things out one circle. If this was not about hurting her, who else was really hurt by this? And take a look at that. I don't know, brain scratchers, what do you think? Let's talk about it in the comments below. Um, of course, I'm almost certain, actually I'm relatively certain Jeff's gonna see this. So let's please be respectful. Let's try to share some smart ideas, maybe give him some different things to consider and look into. Uh, I also look forward to seeing what you guys think about this case. So let's chat about it. Take care everyone, have a nice weekend. I'll see you back here Monday on the Lord Nights channel.